nothing more beautiful than the mountains of Tennessee in springtime. Nothing. And this spring, especially after our devastating flood, to see everything coming back blooming is amazing. And even after our storm on Monday, trees are still coming down, 100-year-old oaks with huge root systems. And it's so humbling and makes you so grateful when you're walking around the woods. This week, I was walking around the woods, and a tree had just fallen. And at the root of the tree was this beautiful trout lily. I love trout lilies. They're one of the most underestimated and overlooked wildflowers we have. It is um, a long lily. It has long yellow kind of genuflected petals that look down and kind of reach towards the sun in the afternoon. And they call them trout lilies because the leaves look like trout. They're um, waxy and speckled. And they only bloom for a couple days. They spend all year in preparation. And I saw it on this trail at the foot of the mountain or the hillside. And I was like, can you believe it made it? All these trees uprooted and this beautiful, beautiful trout lily made it. Thank you, God. When I looked up and realized that the whole hillside was covered in them, thousands of them. Now, if one trout lily is beautiful, a thousand are stunning. And that's what this looks like to me. All these individual acts and all these beautiful people coming together to make a stunning picture of people who really want to hope and create and make this world a place of wonder and hope and regeneration. The most common wildflower or, or weed, depending on your perspective, in the hills of Tennessee, though, is probably the thistle. Anywhere you go that is overlooked or underutilized, that's where the thistles bloom and harvest. They're amazing, amazing flowers. They have a history of survival by brutality, and they have that soft, deep purple center that reminds you of even Solomon in all his glory is not arrayed like one of these. In 1997, I opened a house for women who were coming off the streets, and I'd spent quite a bit of time walking on the streets and going into jails and interviewing women to find out what sanctuary and what something that felt healing would look like. And everywhere I went, I would see these thistles. So we opened up a house, and we all invited women to come in, stay two years, pay no rent, have no authority in the house, and just create community and do whatever they needed to do to be about healing. The women came. They did a beautiful job. We ended up, up opening. Now we have six homes, 28 women in the homes. But about 2001, we realized because women, on average, who come into Magdalene are first sexually abused between the ages of 7 and 11, who have been on the streets about 10 years, who many times hit the streets when they're teenagers and they have no work history, they all have felonies on their record, it makes it almost impossible to get jobs, that if we were about loving people, that we had to help people become economically independent. So we started a bath and body care company. It made perfect sense to me to name it Thistle Farms. It took about eight years to realize in that process that I wasn't actually making anything out of Thistle that it was just kind of a symbolic thing, and I really wanted to start using the thistle. So we started gathering thistles, and we found out you can make beautiful paper out of them. And about a year and a half ago, I was on the side of the road picking thistles when a car drove by and slowed down and looked at me, not in a scary way, but in a concerned way. <laughs> Why is this 45-year-old woman out here bent over picking half-dead thistles? And it occurred to me that I had achieved, maybe on any scale in the world, probably the lowest rung you could grab onto. But I had become a thistle farmer. And that for me, that meant that the whole world was my farm. That I could go anywhere and nobody was going to tell me, don't pick those thistles. <laughs> they would say, I have another field right over here. <laughs> and you could 
go places people were afraid to go and find a beautiful harvest and it reminded you there was nothing in the whole world to be condemned or left behind. And there was always plenty of them to make whatever you needed. And so we made boxes and we made cards and we made all these beautiful things out of thistles to go with what we were packaging in our company. But the problem once, is, once we really started the company and taking this model out in the world that the issue of significance began to have more meaning to me. I had never minded being a small fish in a huge ocean. But in the marketplace, it's a little bit troubling. We were taking in easily less than a million a year, selling bath and body care products. Right now, we only have 35 women working in the company. We have 28 residents that come and live with us. And on the world scale, that is so infinitesimally small, it's hard to grasp. And somehow it feels like to be a single thistle or to be a trout lily undoes you. What is that, how does that really change the world or make any difference? If you're bringing in less than a million dollars, and let's say just the statistics of the State Department last year, that child pornography and the buying and selling of women was over a $4 billion industry, kind of undoes you. And we would go to places like Rwanda and we partnered with a women's group there, 40 women who were part of a cooperative who were going out and making geranium oils. 40 women who would come together after surviving a genocide that killed a million people in 100 days. And we started using their geranium oils and making all kinds of products and packaging in the thistles. And we kept going out and we kept talking last year to all kinds of groups. And we also made sure that every city we went in and we went to talk to the women in prison. You talk about some numbers and significance and insignificance and what does it mean in your work and in your life. We have two and a half million people in prison. The largest number of anyone in the world. We have longer and longer sentences and about 85 to 90 percent of the women who are in prison are there because of drug-related charges. So we go in and we talk about hope and how beautiful a thistle is and try to tell the story. And then we go out and we hawk our bath and body care products. <laughs> it's a living. <laughs> so we go to a prison in Houston last year. Maybe it was about six months ago. And we pack all our geranium oils from Rwanda that also happen to be a mosquito repellent. That's really good information that's just out there for you to take home with you. <laughs> we go into the prison in Houston. There is no air conditioning in the women's prison in Houston. The women work in turnip fields outside all day. The guards there are on horseback. It really, really looks old school. And the women came in to do our program, about 300 women. And we had packed all the books that we brought. We, brought, we, made, we wrote, wrote a book called Find Your Way Home. And we bring the books in, and we have all the bath and body care products. We unpack the books, take them into the prison, and distribute them to the women. And a woman was in about the second row, and she opens the book, and she starts breathing. And she holds the book, and she breathes. She said, what is that? I have never smelled anything like that. You would be surprised what a difference that makes. It was the best news I had heard in years. Somehow a drop of oil had found its way first from a group of women who had survived so much and go out and hope every day and harvest this geranium made its way to Nashville, Tennessee, to another group of women who stamp love heels on every product, found its way into the pages of a book about hope, then found its way to Houston and through the prison walls so that a woman who was ready to smell the fragrance of hope could breathe it in. And I was like, I am so done with all the scales of whatever is big or small or significant or insignificant. On the scale of love, a drop is plenty for me. And I'll take it. 
And I'll take the idea that all of us have no idea how our work impacts each other and what it means to be a beautiful hillside and hope together and to be a part of that. The truth is, on this scale, it's literally just about how much gratitude we can hold for the work that we have been given and the opportunities we've been offered to love each other without judgment, without expectation, but just to love. And I have in my work over the last 15 years with this learned as much from some of the most heartbreaking truths that I've learned as I've learned from the successes that we've experienced as an organization. Not too long ago on the streets of Nashville, Tennessee, I was thinking before I came up here today that just right now as I'm speaking, one of our ex-governors is getting, is being buried and memorialized less than a mile that way. And less than a mile that way, a woman was killed on the streets here this summer and beaten so badly it took three days to identify her. And how much I mourned all of it for her. The loss of everything that she had known and the loss, I think, even for me, of worrying about what if we had done more for her? Maybe she wouldn't have relapsed. What if our world was different and could have handled that when she was a child? Or what if and what if and what if? And I promise you, writing her eulogy was one of the scariest things I've ever done. I was afraid to grieve her and ask people to grieve her with me. What if we allowed ourselves to grieve all those who die from violence in this world? Surely our hearts would break for people we don't know, for people we have never met. When we gathered the community and grieved Rosalind, though, there was no judgment there at all. It was about love. And it was about what a privilege it is for us to celebrate every flower that blooms in this world for however long and to grieve it unashamedly and to remember how that emboldens our heart to go out in love again. None of us are any more or less worthy, not just than the wildflowers that we see before us that return to the earth so gracefully, or the women who make it or don't make it in the program of recovery. But all of us on this scale are lavishly loved by a creator who celebrates it all and who invites us all in to bloom again and to celebrate with each other that we can hope in a spring that never ends. Thank you.